Welcome to Econ Life. Today, I'm very grateful to have Dr. Adel Sanders here with me. How are you going? Oh, all is well. Um, I'm doing quite well. Thank you. Thank so you for I guess having me. Anytime, my pleasure. I guess for the listeners to understand, so they'll hear your American accent, but you're actually based over in Prague. So explain that to us. Yes, well, I um, yep, grew in, up in America from Nebraska to New York, where I met my husband. And uh, after finishing uh, my master's degrees at, at Columbia, I was ready to move on. And, and my husband was to University of Cambridge, which, which actually had the perfect combination that I wanted to study. It had a neuroscience lab within the educational department that was a joint program with the psychology department. So psychology and education are my areas with a foundation in neuroscience as an interest. Um, and so I just combined uh, and they accepted me combining things I love, such mathematics, uh, learning and music, uh, looking at the combination of both. And so, uh, yeah, and so I jumped, I applied at University of Cambridge, which brought me over to this side of the pond. And it's just a beautiful, Cambridge is beautiful. And then when I did a conference here in Prague, uh, I fell in love with it. And we just thought, hey, let me, so I started to apply to, think, to um, physicians here. And I got a teaching position at uh, Charles University, the Universita um, Karlova, their main university. And then shortly after that, I was asked to be Dean um, of Psychology at the University of New York in Prague. So that, that brought us over here as I was wrapping up my, my PhD. So uh, it was a great way to just slide right into this beautiful, another beautiful city. We, we weren't ready to go. We just love um, history and architecture and so, and just the old world feel. And we were still exploring you know, new lands in a sense. Uh, so it was good timing. And so here I've been for uh, 10 years now and it's just, just beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, wow. Because I knew, I wasn't sure how long you'd been in Prague. Like I wasn't sure if it was a recent move. So that's really interesting. So, so tell us about. You did mention that you're now a dean of it, obviously there in the University of New York um, in Prague. So tell us about that. I suppose the change, like you said, moving from a PhD into these positions. Sure. There's a bit of overlap with uh, writing up one's dissertation um, and starting to teach. So there was some overlap, uh, which, which happens almost everyone. Uh, but I mean, it seems many, many people um, as they're transitioning, you know, you start to do some teaching, supervising. So, so that, um, so as I started these positions, I'm wrapping up the PhD because it's just, it's at the writing point. So then, um, yeah, and, and it's pretty natural. I mean, I think it's all education, whether from, from the learner perspective to the teaching perspective, you, you learn, I become a, more knowledgeable in my field by teaching it. And, um, and then I also, you know, I learn, I become a better learner as I, as I teach. And I, it's, it's, they, they both feed into each other well so it's it's just it's natural with with education and and um and again feel you know the field i chose too is uh both education helps people uh but also and helps spread messages and and helps raise it can help raise one's life state just as psychology can and so i think the two fields to me um are coupled and one of the things that led toward my study of non-human animals uh, was well part of the things is in psychology I became a psychologist to relieve suffering <laughs> and one thinks of human suffering which indeed uh, there's a huge need continuously but uh, but the suffering of non-human animals is just as real and just as powerful. 
And there, the more, in fact, I even one of my areas is mathematical cognition. And in, in the research, you're finding, well, many other species, it's uh, in a, the foundational research, well, also do math is evolutionarily, it's, it's an advantage to know uh, the amount of food that's available or the amount of predators that we need to avoid. So they keep track. I was like, they have, you know, highly such a, I, you know that they feel pain and fear that you also wouldn't survive without that. Humans born with a rare disease in which they don't feel pain. You think, oh, wow, great. They don't survive long because no matter how aware you are, how you know you're going to, you're sitting on a knife or your hand is resting on a fire, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's a, a key need all the way from insects to humans. I mean, you know, and there's not a hierarchy actually, but that we think of that too often, but um, so, so that, we, okay, so emotion is easier, I think, hopefully, for people to accept pain and fear. You know, when you start to uh, learn about the, the, the higher levels of cognition. Now, here, I'm going to jump ahead. That You have a great, you, you mentioned, asked me about a quote. I have another quote. I'm going to end on another quote I love. But there's another quote I love that actually I want to, because it applies to my work, that I want to address, if it's okay. I'm just jumping in because oh, yeah. it's all connected. But this quote I love by the philosopher Jeremy Bentham is a many, many, <laughs> uh, I was just going to say vegans and activists, but many people who are compassionate people in general love this quote. So his quote is at the end of a beautiful treatise, but he said, the question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? That is the most important question. And I always go back to that. I'll, I can talk for hours and hours about the higher level cognition of non-human animals, but I always go back to that question because that's the most important thing. But what I found though, is as I'm studying and discussing, even with colleagues at Cambridge, you know, we're, we're stuck in our minds so often and, and we appreciate thinking and a lot of mathematicians I was, were in my smaller college at, 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 at uh, Peterhouse in Cambridge. And so we have these discussions about cognition, mathematics. And, and so when I'm telling them about the, the, the cognition of, of, of a chicken, for example, they could do tra transit higher, higher order math mathematical computations that humans aren't able to do till we're seven or eight, such as transitive inference, which they need to do. They have such complex societies. You know, transitive inference, B is, if B is, greater than A and C is greater than B, then C must be greater than A, but we don't fully get those kinds of relationships till we're about seven or eight. Chickens get this quite early. And things like that, uh, perspective taking, branch of theory of mind, these things that are usually uh, people think only humans can do. So while I would be in these conversations with maybe other scholars at Cambridge, or when they learn that, Somehow that clicks into, oh, I could never, I could, I can't, I, I wouldn't be able to eat a chicken anymore. I mean, because it clicks to it. It's like, oh yeah, they have feeling pain. Well, we do it quickly. Uh, or, you know, oh, but it's, it's done humanely. So, oh, I, I know there must be fear and pain, but it's quick. We, we do it nicely. When you see their higher level, you're like, wait a second. Okay. Hmm. Wow. They might be suffering from day one because they're, they just, were artificially, their mother was artificially assimilated, inseminated. They were bo uh, born, taken from their mother at a young age. They were in K enslaved and exploited their entire lives. And then they have to travel to this frightening. When the awareness of the consciousness raises, I noticed something in the eyes and hearts of colleagues of mine who had, again, uh, shifts. So I do. And again, it, I'm a cognitive psychologist and developmental psychologist. So of course, that's my area as well. But I do find value nonetheless in talking about this. I mean, I actually, uh, I, I, I admit my recent TED talk, I, I put it together because later than I would have liked because all this new research kept coming out. I was like so excited. So, but nonetheless, I did 
run through part of it a couple of days before and and a colleague I was reading it to as you know he's, he's not vegan at, at all or anything but just I was talking about spider cognition he's like oh my I didn't realize this so next time I you know I just squish him and get you know I'm out there in the house I just squish I, I didn't even think I, I won't be able to do that anymore so just knowing wow they're problems I hadn't thought of that as problem solving when they make their webs anyway so so I, I think that's one way I, I do advocacy. I mean, I, just in a natural way, learning myself, but also realizing their sentience on many levels. So I hope that's one of the ways I can help as well. It's, a, it's been a natural progression for me to, and also to point out, we all have our own human within the human species as well as across different species, our own amazing talents and abilities and ways of thinking. Some people are better at doing mathematics. Some people are better at painting great art, works of art. Is, is Picasso any less of a genius than John Nash who was featured in Beautiful Mind? You know, they're both geniuses. So within our species that's an important point but across species i mean if you look at spatial navigation i mean we're idiots i mean humans are idiots compared to birds <laughs> no you know if i could somebody attest, attest this a quote to, to einstein that's similar to you know, that if we judge the intelligence of a fish by how they fly or a bird by how they swim and they both be idiots i i don't apparently it might not have been from einstein and that was definitely not a direct quote, but uh, but it's that idea, you know, of how do we judge other species? You know, let's stop judging first of all. But you know, I mean, we're all great in our own ways. We wouldn't have survived. <laughs> so, so that that uh, more more of my background and 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 how uh, how I not only got to Prague and in the field, but but how it's relating to something we're both interested in. Yeah. But, and so tell us about, I have watched your recent TED talk. So tell for people that may not have seen that, give us a little bit of insight into the subject matter and also, I guess, yeah, people's reactions to that. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. So uh, as I, again, I think I've, one area that comes up a lot <laughs> Um, in neuroscience and when discussing our evolution and you know is brain size uh, and uh, and people we often have tried humans have tried <laughs> to judge our superiority by a brain size and if you look at the history actually our brains have gotten smaller than they used to be and they're also smaller than Neanderthals who we kind of make fun of um, uh, as far as if we're going to joke about lesser intelligence well their brains were a lot were, were bigger than ours but uh so brain size really shouldn't have been a criteria via which we judge intelligence but we have tried and so <laughs> and it's almost humorous the history so i start my talk with just talking about the hierarchical um concepts we've had way back from our aristotle and giving him credit obviously he's a great philosopher um on the side he was a naturalist so he did he he, he looked at uh, you know natural fossils, and he came up upon some kind of pre-evolutionary ideas. But his he had this this uh, ranking chart. Um, you know, started with with uh, God and angels, and then I don't know all the in between man and woman. You know, it's kind of funny, but you know, thousands of years ago. But it is kind of humorous. I mean, the, the main figure looks a lot. Like, the top figure looks like him quite a bit. Um, so, so starting even with Aristotle, I think this hierarchy, this concept of a hierarchy um, w existed. And so even in modern era, we when trying to define intelligence, we, we went to the brains, but I, in my talk, I go to more details of how each theory we came up with explaining why we're higher than the other got knocked out once we learned it <laughs> more about other species brains. And I, I talked a little bit about the measurement um, uh, faults in measurements. I'm also a researcher. I, I, I research uh, for at National Institute of Mental Health in Czechia, but I also, as a colleague at Cambridge, a lot of my colleagues would notice I would 
find little little uh, problems that help with their research. And so it's always been a fun problem solving thing. So, so one of the things that's key is measurement itself. So uh, in my talk, I, I discuss in a, from the conceptual problems behind this you know, hubris based hierarchical uh, way that we've put ourselves to compare to other animals. The, so I go through the faults in that measurement, but measurements themselves um, um, have differed between a human and, and a non-human. And the measures, if that's faulty, the, the entire result is faulty. So, uh, so what I address also in a, there's a thread, a side thread throughout that maybe scientists or psychologists or, or maybe anyone will, will appreciate in that, uh, we've got to watch our own arrogance and we've got to watch our own research methodology. We need to be more objective and, and we need to be cautious about how we do have prejudices and biases where we, we often have misjudged non-human animals in the past. So, so, um, so then I also talk about these special features of you know, the brain size, how we now know, for example, with Haller's rule, other than among primates beyond, when we go beyond primates, there's that general rule that, that as size decreases of, a, of the being, the ratio of brain to body size increases. So in other words, a bird has a much higher ratio uh, than a human. It's like, oh no, we don't want to know that, a human would say. You know, and then in insects as well, it's fascinating. So, so this is relatively recent research. It's very exciting for me, but, uh, and also the researchers trying to make smaller, you know, phones, they're, they're, they're uh, studying spiders. How can such small beings be so intelligent, you know, and, you know, really it comes down to really, how does it work? You know, efficiency, functionality, rather than uh, size, you know, so that's, Small. And I make a joke, I, I joke sometimes to my students, like, well, I'm so glad too with this research because I kind of have a small head for a, for, a, <laughs> for, a, for a human. I have to buy children's size hats and uh, children's size glasses, but um, no, but it's like, and there's not much of a difference between males and females. There is some of a difference. There, that, that argument was attempted in the past as well and completely knocked, knocked out. So it's behavior. Is it, can the being uh do this well and the memories of birds the problem solving abilities of birds alone not to even mention insects is is high level high level so it just knocks it out um and so i i i, I also in the talk i i about 10 years ago I, I was very saddened to see a ted talk by a very prominent psychologist child human child psychologist, quite so prominent, she's in textbooks and, and speaking of based on this theory that she had that hadn't really fully been tested and has since been disproved. But, uh, but I was very kind in the talk. I, I didn't call her out directly, but nonetheless, she, she made jokes about, you know, the reason that, um, Crows are on the cover of Science Magazine and chickens are in the soup box because they're dumb as stumps. And she used that phrase, said, oh, same with ducks and geese. And I'm like, okay, let's disprove this. Um, let's, let's, let's share some information to counter that claim, that non-scientifically based claim from a very so famous scientist. So I, I, I vowed to myself 10 year go, years ago that through the same medium, through a TED talk, I would refute uh, her mis, um, you know, judgment and, and joking statement that, that kind of almost uh, validated probably, I don't know her dietary choices, but a lot of us would validate or justify our choices by just saying, yeah, they're dumb. They don't know what's going on. So I can therefore harm them, you know, throw them in a soup pot. Um, so I made a vow to myself that I would refute that one day uh, scientifically, you know, in a proper, proper way. And, and, and 
wonderfully over those last 10 years, more and more research. I finally, you know, came to the level where I was asked uh, to, to speak um, and I suggested this topic. So, uh, so, so the talk, hopefully uh, your viewers will see, but I do share some amazing things that birds and insects do. I also made a point over the summer, I, I researched a little more on insect cognition. I, I made a point to make sure I spoke about crickets because I do I did know a little bit about them in the past, their communication abilities and their, even there was interesting because over 450 species have been found to uh, exhibit homosexual behavior. Just, you know, I just like to make the point, this is a biological, it's a whole other topic in a sense, but it's biological preference, et cetera. So it, that's come up a few times. And in the research of looking at these other animals that have been found to have homosexual behavior, I looked at, there's a lot, there's interesting research on crickets. I was like, wow, they have a quite free flowing. There were a lot of different theories. I was like, whoa, there's a lot going on. They have a whole society. They have these preferences, sexual preferences, and, and even communication. They have songs, a song that the, the, the male will sing after having sex. And then the a song that he'll sing to try to attract a female with serenade. You know, they're quite actually intelligent and quite sentient. They, they have, uh, I've seen myself, you, you, I feel sad if I, uh, you know, see them being stuck in a cage to be fed to pet lizards or I see pet stores. Uh, it makes me very sad. So now there's this whole trend people talking about, they're making flour out of crickets and they're making like, people are eating a fancy restaurant in London has is serving crickets so now that means more sentient beings quite sentient who will huddle in a corner from fear when a predator approaches you know and, and they mate and they have very complex mating process and societal processes the idea that that's a move forward uh just for the earth or what excuse me, we don't need animal protein, but that's a whole other nutrition, plenty of science behind that. Um, anyway, so that also motivated me. I want people to know about the sentience of insects as well, particularly crickets, since that seems to be a strange food choice uh, that people are talking about. It's some strange headline saying, should vegans start eating insects? What, from what angle is that? that Maybe they're thinking that all vegans care about is the is, is the climate change. I'm not sure where where that would even the logic behind that. A, a vegan, as I would define it, is is one you know is is a lifestyle based on wanting to reduce suffering. I mean, there's plant based vegan eating that's purely for health and and that's still good. But you know, and sure. Um, if we talk about the earth, well, I'm surprised we don't talk more about the existing problems from eating animals, such as pollution, land use, water use, starvation from the, the inefficient use of resources. I mean, I don't know why people aren't talking about that as much as future, because uh, that's causing a lot of arguments. And But anyway, I don't know where that came from, but, uh, but not, but Vegans, as I understand, an ethical vegan is to reduce suffering to the largest degree. And that would, why on earth would we start to eat even smaller animals and even more would suffer that when we don't even need it? So that's a very strange uh, conversations that I've seen pop up lately. So I did want to address that as well. So I, so I you know, you saw the talk, I mean, I, I, I weave it, in <laughs> some of these things. This gave me a chance to maybe talk. Again, I had to squeeze a lot into 18 minutes, but gave me a chance to give maybe a more of a background with some of my motivation as well um, as for the talk and, and for some of the points I make in the talk. And I have had reaction. We did positive reactions. Yeah, again, people surprised if they you know, hadn't considered vegans and there's, there, there's they are surprised and 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 now are rethinking their their food choices and uh, and even a lot of vegans though didn't realize about insects they hadn't really thought about uh, insects or or these uh, in a way that 
you know, why maybe scientists even don't understand. It's just that their, their tunnel vision is on their area. You know, it's, it's not that they don't care necessarily. It's just that that's not their area. So it's not that they're mean or uncaring. Uh, other psychologists or scientists, it's just they hadn't thought of it. They're, they're human, like all of us. And if your, par your parents do it, something, it's like, well, you grow up just thinking. And that's, that's why it's so funny when people assume they should ask about nutrition to their doctor. Well, doctors, poor things. I mean, they assume they know because, you know, they, they, you know, but they just have, are influenced by what they grew up with. But I have several friends who have friends who's a pediatrician. She couldn't beg for a nutrition course. They don't include nutrition in the program, which is why I love Neil Barnard at Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He's really trying to um, advocate for including nutrition in medical programs because people are going to ask you and, and um, they assume doctors know. So I always encourage people when you speak, speak to a nutritionist, not necessarily a doctor. I think when a doctor starts studying it, then, then they can have a really great grasp like Dr. Barnard or um, also the founder of nutrition.org. Um, love the guy, blanking on his name, but uh, anyway, so I think there's great doctors out there who have studied nutrition. Anyway, so part of my uh, response, some of the response has also been about, wow, surprised that more scientists don't realize. But yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of time to study other species. I mean, beautiful studies out there, for example, on the, the linguistic ability of, of prairie dogs. Um, this scientist in the U.S. spent 30 years studying their language ability. Our, as our technology improved, we can study animals better. We can hear the high pitches we didn't hear before, or the low pitches of elephants, which we didn't hear before. They, they communicate much more often than we realize. We hear the, the alarm call, but we don't hear their deep, deep, deep vibrations. Same, we don't hear the high, high vibrations of insects or even little prairie dogs. It just sounds like blah, blah, blah. But he analyzed, they have grammar, they have it's just their language. It, they have dialects among different parts of the U.S. Fascinating uh, that alone. But to find all of this out, he gives you give you're a 20 minute talk on it. It took 30 years to get that information. So of course people aren't aware of all the fine tunings and the brilliance of animals. It takes a long time to study one animal, one species, one aspect of one species. So anyway. So I'm also, um, so that, that again, it's not to, to say anything negative about other scientists or psychologists, but to let people know that, you know, we, we, we have a lot to learn and, and, and they are not necessarily going to be aware. It's not their fault. They're not necessarily going to be aware of these things. And, but we do have to get, do bit better research. Uh, we have to be aware of these things going forward though. If we're going to, if you want one, is going to speak to a large audience um, and say such things, um, kind of semi justifying harming them. That's a problem, and that's why I called her out. She has, you know, very is, and the talk itself was very, very popular because what she says about child development is great, but when she goes outside the species, she literally has no idea what she's talking about. In your TED talk, you actually reference and show pictures of a chicken from Lefty's Place here in Australia. So do you have a connection or how did you, yeah, what made you incorporate them? Oh, I just love that place. The reason I know about them is just simply from Instagram. And I was, I would just notice, and I tend to follow a lot of farm sanctuaries. Uh, I have a history with that as well, but uh and I just, well, first of all, I, the, the photo struck me. She, and, and, and I shouldn't have been surprised when later I contacted her if I could use some of her beautiful photos for my TED Talk. And I shouldn't have been surprised to find that she's a photographer, a professional photographer, because these just gorgeous portrait-like photos and, and, and also naturalistic settings as well as portraits. And, and then what she says about it is so touching. I mean, I literally, well, I, I literally, I'm, I'm sensitive soul, but you know, I literally have shed tears reading these real life stories of the rescues. I mean, I just even thinking about it, I get, oh, I just get teary eyed, you know. They're just, you know, such 
feeling living, you know, these beings. And she, by sharing her, the individual personal traits of all the beings she rescues, you, you adds to the level of understanding, you know, and, and hopefully inspires others to care for them more. And even if they're already vegan, you know, maybe help with more rescues or, but so I've been so touched by both the photos and, and the, the words on her site. I just adore her. Um, and she, I was so happy she you know, allowed me to use some of her photos. And um, there's also another one, Sage Mountain Fa Sanctuary and, uh, in, in America. And, and they also similar response, sure enough, professional photographer, you know, wonderful writer, writes individual stories about the animals. Um, and, and I just, so it's so beautiful. And, and some of the photos uh, I also used were in Prague. One is of a fellow animal rights activist, Eva Karska, who goes and she goes to the plazas in Prague uh, where a lot of the pigeons will, will go. And, and again, people think of them as these annoying, I also, purposely speak about it. They're, they're brilliant. I, I didn't even get to talk, speak about all of their traits because of time, but they're, they're quite intelligent. I speak about their ability to distinguish between uh, even Monet and Picasso, uh, but I didn't squeeze in the fact that they, they outsmarted first year college art students on this as well. So People might not even, if you're not a cognitive scientist, you might not also understand how high level some of their intelligence is. But so a lot of people think of pigeons as nuisances. Well, one of the things she does is she looks out for them and um, looks for threads or plastic that's caught in their little talons and, uh, and often human hair too. I did, you know, there are sometimes people say, oh, well, they use human hair for uh, if you look at maybe general animal uh, sites, one time there was a point, somebody was saying to me, but no, they use human hair for nesting. And I did find that on a site. And I thought, that's great. They can do that. They sometimes will do that. But the problem is um, if you go to more uh, speci specific avian, um, with avian science, uh, such as um, there's a famous one, the Audubon Society, they will talk about how strong human hair is and how it often does get caught up. So from now on, I brush my hair, I, I cut it up in little tiny pieces. And so we learn from her. So she finds, uh, but again, definitely thread. We don't think of that. Definitely dental floss. I don't use that anymore. I, I, I anyway, so, I, you know, we can all learn in terms of how, what we throw out in our garbage because it really damages them. And so what she does is she has her supplies. She has food. <laughs> they all know her. They trust her food, um, uh, scissors, anesthesia, and um, little, you know, little uh, things to help them, her little kit. And, um, and she, she goes to these plazas. So one of her photos is in, in uh, she, she's in the photo, but she just sets up her video camera. And, and so she also took the photo and it's, it's a freeze frame from her video. And, so, so I use that and also there's a, a sanctuary here because again, the stories from sanctuaries, same, I lived in New York for a while. And, um, when I moved to Czechia, I, I noticed there's a lot of wonderful activists here, fabulous. And so I contacted one of them, Teresa, um, 10 years ago and said, hey, it would be wonderful. When I had a dream for my many years to open a, 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 a farmed animal sanctuary and um, would you like to do it with me? You know, she's, and, and at first, of course, she, she's, well, oh, I live in the city and I don't have time, you know, to, to be on a farm. I said, no, but you, the, the value is you don't have to live on a farm. There's so many wonderful people here. I think, I think we could find people to take care of the farm, but maybe get it going. And I shared with her, Teresa, um, stories from, like Lefty's Place, but from, uh, Catskill Animal Sanctuary. It was founded by, actually, she was a former principal of an elementary school, so she was an educator, and she, this is over 10 years ago, I was always, I was inspired by her stories about not only, so you're rescuing the individual animal, animal but you're 
they become advocates, they become educators themselves. And um, even just visiting, I brought some friends who were vegetarian, but when they, it's a farm sanctuary, the famous farm sanctuary, the main one at Watkins Glen years ago. And, you know, after meeting these dairy cows who, and knowing their stories of the, the babies, the boys from veal farms, and they, you gave up, you know, couldn't imagine eating you know, dairy or cheese after that, after you meet the individual. So this Catskill Animal Sanctuary, she's a wonderful writer, and she also had these beautiful stories similar to Lefty's Place. And so I sent them to Teresa. I said, well, you know, we can, we can really advocate for animals through, through these stories. So we went through the whole process. We looked and looked, there weren't any. There was one well-meaning person. There was one that was the closest we could find because we thought maybe we would join with somebody, a man named Petra, who had a little kind of a sanctuary, but it turns out he sold the eggs of the chickens. We're like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> it has to be 100% vegan, you know, that's, that's not a sanctuary. I mean, he treated them nicely, but anyway, so, but we just started from scratch and found a wonderful woman joined on board later, Marie, who sure enough, we, we, we all got together to help try to find land and you know, really from ground up, my husband created a logo. Some other people also had great, my husband's a graphic designer, so he came up with a really cool logo. There were other really great logos. Um, and so this wonderful Czech artist, she also had an adorable logo that they went with. Uh, you know, we all decided that's fabulous. So anyway, so um, Pharma Nadjeye, which is um, Farm of Hope, was, uh, I, again, I co-founded it, but then Marie and then others have just taken they live, she lives there. I just, again, worship her and all of the, you know, she, what a saint, you know, cause she's there with them directly caring for the animals. And, and then she has lots of volunteers and other people to help, but she also works she, you know, so many. And now it's actually in 10 years, there's now many of them in Czech Republic, many of them. And their stories, I just translate, I helped with the editing, the English translation of, of a document, a short documentary of another woman who, who found it. I mean, she's works full time. There's another sanctuary. There's many of them now. It's just amazing. This country, this small country is filled with amazing activists. Um, and, and so one of the photos is of uh, ducks is from also Farm of Nadia, Farm of Hope. That, that again, that farm I co-founded and, and uh, so, Many, many of the, you know, so I wanted to also make a point that the only photos, either they were free of fully free animals like the goose family, because they mate for life. I did want to find a natural, uh, naturalistic setting of, of a family of geese, which I was able to find. But otherwise, I wanted to, you know, show these beautiful san animals at sanctuaries on, you know, on purpose. So, uh, so yes, so that's how, uh, that came about. <laughs> See, Fantastic. social media can, you know, it, it has its dangerous side, but it, it has such wonderful potential and, you know, to do activism and share the word and share, show how wonderful these creatures are and, and share rescue stories. So that's, that's my long explanation, of like my long backstory on that. <laughs> I've just realized that we haven't actually learned about how you went vegan. Sure. Okay. Well, that's also interesting too, because I, you know, I'm from Nebraska, which is Midwest, and I have a lot of uh, family who are farmers, still are animal farmers, and uh, but I have a, a wonderful cousin. I, I adore her, uh, who um, I grew up with, <laughs> and uh, when I first started posting about dairy. Dairy, the sorrows of, I mean, that's Daryl, Dairy, I have a whole background on all well, the sorrows behind that, but uh, she, I, you know, I mean, uh, she, she's been very positive response. You know, I think she has a huge heart and I think she's also realizing, you know, I think that if, you know, if she were starting out again, or even anyway, she married a dairy farmer, but, you know, who, who I'm sure they mean well, but I, I, I think, I, I think her heart is, um, on another level of understanding at this point. And, and I think she uh, is possibly, I mean, I don't want to directly, I haven't directly spoken with her, but I do know 
that she's seen a lot of my posts and and I think when we have a continued to have a very positive conversation but but that isn't the well there's a little bit of the background too is that um so a couple things around probably around nine or ten you know visiting the farm again she and her family just such nice people but <laughs> what stood out right away and disturbed me uh, at, at around that age, uh, for example, just in such a casual way, I, I think they didn't really think of it. I guess you grow up with it, but we're going to go out and get dinner, you know, and they'd go out and they, you know, had all these chickens and just literally, literally would rip the head off of the chicken who obviously is so upset. The body is still running around, which is that terrible saying, you know, oh, running around like a chicken with your head cut off. <laughs> we laugh at these sayings, but they come from a real place. And I was like, oh, that's dinner. And but I remember being so disturbed because, of course, then we now now I know more how smart, not only smart, but how tight their familial bonds are. And actually, by the time the baby comes out, the chick comes out of, of the egg, they are have already been communicating. There are already have, the mother and the baby have already have a number of words together uh, that are there's an understanding already. Baby day old chicks, I combine my music psychology sometimes, um, they recognize harmonious music and prefer it over non-harmonious music. I mean, they're amazing creatures. So, but I just remember that was one of my first memories of being disturbed by it. But what's fascinating is the power of also the adults telling you what you're supposed to do and 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 the power of conformity as I now as a psychologist know that we're social beings and we make fun of sheep for that sheep are super smart by the way uh, people don't realize we make we we use that as a derogatory term ah oh, we're sheep we but hey it creates they're wonderful they're wonderful societies we have very complex wonderful societies that because we do conform and get along so we so well, so for the most part, that's a good thing. That's helped us create large civilizations. But nonetheless, that same feature can be dangerous. We just go along, and so I just go along. Well, we, you know, we're supposed to eat meat, though, and ooh, I, I don't, I don't feel good about this. I would feel really sad for like the whole rest of the day, but I ate it because I thought I was supposed to. But what's strange is in having such powerful uh, experiences that I, I remember clearly to this day, maybe I was younger, maybe I was eight, I, I really don't know how old I was, but, but then I would then continue to eat this stuff. Um, so, so, so then, so I kept eating, at, you know, as a child, and, uh, and then, so it wasn't until, uh, and interestingly enough, um, and this came up with some activists a couple years ago who, uh, one at one of the activists said she she started being vegan for health reasons. For health reasons, it should be about the animals. Well, we all know that ultimately, yeah, on an ethical level, now that we know, but she said it very well. She said, she says, well, well yeah, now of course that's my main reason. But she says, but at the time, maybe I we both we were all talking about, it. I don't know who said what, but I kind of chimed in. But it's almost like once we realize that we not only don't need it for health, but that actually we can thrive. I always, my little saying I like to say, you know, is that not only can we survive without animal proteins or animals eating animals at all in any, nor their, uh, their flesh, nor their, their secretions, but um, not only can we survive, but we could thrive. We're likely to thrive even more. But so once we realize that it almost gives us permission to open our hearts to their suffering. Where I think, you know, the cognitive dissonance is so strong, this, 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 we don't wanna be, we don't, we wanna live by our values. And if we have, most people have the value, nonviolent values, but yet if you're eating an animal, then you're violating now with that and you don't want to do that. So you justify it by not knowing about or not recognizing their sentience. I think once you realize that you you're but when so it's that cognitive dissonance being that that uh, when your behavior doesn't line up with your principles or your values so so there's that dissonance it's a musical term but you know I kind of it doesn't it sits doesn't sit well so we if we're not ready to change or we think we can't if we think we have to have animals 
Um, so we're not ready to change the behavior. We justify, we change our minds and we feel better inside. So a lot of times I knew a person who used to work at a, in England, they call it abattoir. They make it sound so nice. Well, what's an abattoir? Oh, it's a slaughterhouse. Oh, okay. Such, such a pretty word for such a horrible place. But he was like, animals don't feel, I mean, he was like, he didn't even work there anymore, but he had clung to that because I think that guilt you must feel. It's like, well, what about the screaming? Well, that, it's just an automatic machine response. It's like amazing what we're, we're able to justify. So I think that once you realize, oh, I can be healthy without it, then we can let go of that wall we've created to, to help us uh, not live with such painful cognitive dissonance. So anyway, um, so once I, so I had a lot of health problems. I mean, I was in high school, I had ulcers, I had anemia, had anxiety, all kinds of problems. And so when I moved to New York and the anxiety increased, and, <laughs> you know, I finally went to a top nutritionist and he was great. He, he, he also gave me a little background. He said, you know, he, he wrote a lot. He published a lot in the field. And he, he also said the, uh, well, he said dairy, said all, he said, and he didn't talk about ethics. He talked about pure nutritional science. And again, he was a scholar and I just went to the top. I thought, let me just, cause I was already looking into becoming a scholar myself. I was like, I'm only going to go to a scholar on this. And, and he had books everywhere. He was a wonderful person. But, but anyway, he said that uh, plant-based proteins are so much better for the human body you know, lentils for, you know, and the amount of protein within the same amount of lentils versus ham, in fact, I mean, it's just the difference. There's more uh, value-based protein packed in, but he, but he, was, he talks a lot about lentils and how valuable they are. Of course, we know in the nuts and seeds, they're most natural things for us to eat. But, um, but so, and he, but he said, if you give up nothing else right away, give up dairy, because I had a lot of stomach problems. And he said, the dairy industry is trying to uh, pay me to say it's good and I, I will refuse. You know, he refused to write. So, so it's, that kind of gave me a background of that these scientists are compromising their, their, their values and principles by uh, uh, sometimes, you know, taking the money instead or writing. Um, and sometimes maybe if they need money or want funding, they might convince themselves. Once again, that cognitive dis dissonance at play, convince themselves. So maybe it is better to have, you know, maybe uh, so they don't feel so bad about taking the money, they convince themselves perhaps. So it's not, uh, anyway, so so he, so I got off dairy right away. I felt so much better, you know, and then, and shortly after that, I got off all animal uh, foods. And then when I later also heard about uh, how bees are treat, you know, how the wings of the bee, queen bee and, and, and how you're really taking the, the food from their baby, that they spend all this time creating honey for their, their own little uh, families. I mean, you know, and I found out about bees and, and actually it turns to regular sugar anyway. I, anyway, I gave up honey later on, but um, so, so it wasn't, um, and so, so then for, for health, and then sh not long after that, again, I allowed myself, I had always been donating to the classic animal welfare, cat, dog sanctuaries, right? And so I was donating regularly to this one shelter. And they sent me uh, one time, I said, can you, are, are there, could you send me in? For, this is way back over 20 years. I've been vegan for 25 years. So, so this, this journey began 25 years ago. <laughs> Um, so with this nutritionist and, um, so, so yes, yeah, so this at the beginning of this journey. And so then I shortly went almost hundred percent vegan. And then later until I gave up honey, I'd say hundred percent and wool and, um, I don't buy new wool. I have old stuff. I have to admit that's from ages of, from a thrift store with holes all over them. I mean, anyway, I do have a couple of those, but uh, anyway, I would never buy new wool now that I know about that. But so, so, uh, so the, uh, uh, when I asked them, I sent back, I said, do you have any information on, are there sanctuaries for farm animals? You know, so then I got this beautiful, so they sent me lovely, uh, it was, um, cause this regular animal welfare organization forgot their name of them. Cause I've donated to so many of them. Um, but they did send me. I think it was vegan outreach uh, material. 
and also farm sanctuary i found out shortly after that i was like and then i just really hadn't struck the suffering so so from that point i kind of uh short kind of shortly after becoming vegan for health reasons again it allowed it gave me permission to care in a sense now that i look back as a psychologist what what, what went on why it, it like freed me to fully allow myself to care and so then i started to really support farm saying farmed animal sanctuaries and and do like you know there weren't a lot of 25 years ago as many activists around especially well here in nebraska but i had moved to new york but even then um I tried to do, there wasn't a, a lot, a huge amount of activism out there, but, but so I did a lot, just shared leaflets and just in my own little ways, did my own activism. Um, again, a lot of leaflets handing out and, and such, but it wasn't until I um, moved, uh, well, I, you know, I, I, it kept bothering me more and more, you know, about their suffering and I had to do more and more. It, so it, it increased more and more over the years, but um, but in terms of uh, becoming more of a, a full out activist, uh, it's more recent, um, and and it, it even increased because my conversations with people, I, I, I um, uh, through also just posts, of course, of once social media became a thing, and uh, and actually I have a lot of people who see my Facebook or Instagram posts who said they became vegan because of them. And, and some, I, some I didn't even realize till later. Uh, one, one colleague at Cambridge, I mean, I, after I had left Cambridge and came back to visit, he had some of my recipe, he was saving all my recipes and, and uh, without even telling him, he didn't even like my post, he didn't hit like, but he was saving them. So, so those, you can make a difference, you know, and donating, it's all those wise, smaller ways, but, um, and then when I became dean, you know, and then you think, well, you don't want to have a big political stance, you know, as dean uh, of a university. So I still kind of secretly, uh, but again, Teresa and I are starting to get to know all these wonderful activists. And I would go to the parade and um, founded, co-founded the sanctuary and wrote about it. But, um, but you know, a couple of years ago, um, uh, I just, uh, I was moved. I, uh, you know, again, as I as I saw the activities that Czech activists were doing, they they, they do these beautiful uh, vigils at, at 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 you know as the pigs are uh, leaving the farm sanctuaries. And actually, as I was finishing writing up my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, I was in a village outside of Prague, um, and. It was like five in the morning, six in the morning. I was, I had to finish a chapter. I was trying to th finish my darn uh, dissertation. <laughs> and so it's super early in the morning. And I hear these, this, this, this loud, again, it's a tiny little village, like a couple hundred people, but we were near a little shop across the way. And I heard this ruckus, like metal, the sound of metal and, and then kind of screaming and I ran out. Sure enough, it was a, a pig, uh, pigs in a, a huge truck being transported. And I stood there and I, I just started chanting. I did not me a whole ring get killed. It's my mantra. And I was like chanting and crying as their noses were trying to gasp for breaths and they were trying to even stand properly. And they were all of them trying to get some air. And I was just, oh my God. Oh my gosh, I was just so upset, you know, and then the guy had just gotten some coffee or something and he drove on off with these suffering tortured beings. And I, and I, I went in, I didn't want to make a ruckus, but I, you know, there's a line there at the butcher. It's almost, it's already must have been six by then. It opened early. It was a farming community and they're lined up to buy meat. And I didn't make a ruckus, but I just said to the woman, the, the one woman right there, I just said, you know, they all suffer. I mean, there was just a truck out there of pigs and she, no, that was cows. I mean, I had photos. I mean, it was the pigs. I don't know why she thought it was cows, but she just had walked in quickly. But I just went quietly to the back. I said, I said, uh, so I, I said, well, they really, they really, really suffer. Please reconsider. And I went to the back. I knew all the people that worked there. And I went to the back. I said, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make a ruckus. I know that was in the line, but you know, it's really, there is so much suffering. Can I give you some 
reading material later. You know, I, it's just the suffering of these animals. I think we need to know about. So I gave her some material in check on um, veganism and and um, background and and uh, and I got. It's interesting. A couple of weeks later, I got a, a a little blue envelope in my mailbox in this tiny village, and it was a woman who said she heard about that there's this woman with a lot of compassion for animals who came to the store and, and, and her name, this person writing me, his name's Petra. She was from that village and she moved to London and she said she's vegan herself. And she was alone all these years, no one understood her. So she was so happy to hear. So someone told her, oh, there's a woman in the village who actually cares about farm animals. And she, she, she spoke with a lot of compassion at the store. And so I, made, I became friends with a woman named Petra from that village uh, and uh, who later we ended up meeting in person. But uh, so it's just how, it's amazing how these little seeds we plant get around. But it also, things like that can up my ante for wanting to do more, you know, more activism. So, so these wonderful people in Czech Republic, uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of factory farms here as well. They're everywhere, you know, and they're all treated the same pretty much. Uh, and so they're, they do great activism and, and really innovative things such as uh, they do this beautiful, this beautiful old town across the bridge. They do, and I participate in this kind of thing as well, where they do a vigil, a, a funeral march, you know, with, for the animals. And it's done in a very, as it should be in a very serious way, but, but, but uh, making a point and then at the end of the, the, the march through beautiful old town and across the Charles Bridge, you know, there's candles are lit and, and we do, and I was asked to give a speech. Um, so I, I gave it, and after one of the, also the, the um, walks, I was also asked to give a speech because they knew my behind the scenes work, starting the sanctuary and going to uh, writing about it and, and, and such. So, so then just to where I became more, um, Outward. It's interesting because I think the, the, a lot of my students are uh, also very, you know, I teach comparative psychology as well as uh, general psychology, but comparative psychology is becoming a uh, very uh, popular and important field. Um, in fact, at one of the top APS uh, psychology conferences, pre-COVID conference where you, people were meeting in person, two of the three keynote speakers were comparative psychologists, primatologists who work in a very beautiful way with totally free like sanctuaries and, and the animals come in, it's just cognitive things that they, it's like a game and really wonderful, brilliant scholars were the speakers. And it's actually becoming required at a lot of universities. In fact, uh, so degrees aren't even being nostrified without it. I mean, evolutionary psychology, et cetera. So, so it's required at our university now and as well to, to line up with ministry uh, uh, guidelines, et cetera. And so, um, so they're learning about the amazingness of it. So it gave me a chance to learn more about other animals and to, to teach. But I'm learning from my students that it's actually, and we know statistically 30 and under, I mean, it's becoming more and more uh, uh, not a strange thing, you know, it's becoming more and more popular, more and more people are into um, veganism, even whether it's through, for health, for the earth, for, uh, for the animals, but it's, it's not this strange fringe trop topic. So for many reasons, I think the zeitgeist changed in, in, on, on the planet um, and also updated research, the knowledge we have, and also um, so, I became a little more, or not directly, I, anything I say in a classroom is research-based. Every single thing I say is research-based. I say, yes, I'm biased. We all have biases. So like, that's why we do research so carefully because everyone wants to, even if it's just you want your, your research to work, you're going to have bias, you know, but that's why we have to do proper methodology. That's why we have to be very, very careful, uh, especially psychology. It's mine, you know, it's so, it, um, you know, kind of fuzzy, it can be, you have to be very strict with methodology. So as a teacher, I'm very, I'm always research-based. I always, you know, I'm honest 
with where I feel that I never would ask the student what they eat. I don't want to even know. I mean, sometimes they'll tell me after class, but uh, it's I would never ask or suggest what they're supposed to do in their private lives. But I will share research. I will share about the cognition and the emotional levels of non-human animals. So, so more and more, I think, uh, so what I noticed, this one form of activism, um, anonymous for the voiceless, I noticed where they show the, well, it's done in, what I liked about it, it was done in an artistic way and, and in a way that kind of makes it uh, more accessible by its very artistic uh, expression. Um, obviously they have voices, animals have voices, but uh, but no one's listening to them, you know, or bothering to learn what they're saying. So speaking, it's the, the phrase is speaking for the animals. But um, I uh, notice by showing, you know, the, the, the process of showing, uh, showing some of the reality, but, but with soft music, not if they, if people heard the screams, that's a whole other level. So it's softly done, artistically done with the masks, but it allows, it's really outreach, it's educational outreach. So it allows only if people are interested, only if they are curious or concerned by the footage, if they're willing to talk, we will, I started to do this, as you say, I say we, a couple years ago. Um, and again, I don't announce it at the school, but once in a while a student might see me out, out doing outreach, but I found I'm just not gonna hide. Um, and I will, I think I found, I did one, and I saw when I, I did my first, I was behind the mask and I saw people's eyes shift to compassion. I was like, so I was so scared my first one because I thought, am I either going to ball or I got, or people are going to be mean, but 99.9, .9, and I've been doing it for two years now, of the responses are positive. I think the way it's set up, it's soft. No one's pushing them. It's their choice. But when I see uh, the eyes of people go to compassion or concern. That is 99% of the time I see that shift. It gives me hope for humans, you know, and, and for the future of, it's just a matter of tapping into compassion and helping guide with knowledge too, because again, the fear of nutrition, and, but it's, we focus on the suffering of the animals. So I became, you know, I became when I became an organizer, it was when other organizers were leaving and they thought, oh, it's the Prague chapter. I was kind of new and they're, oh, Prague chapter is probably, there aren't that many, you know, it's not, it's, gonna, it's, not, it's really going to dissolve because people are moving and there aren't that many people. I was like, no, I became mama bear. I said, no, <laughs> I will, um, that can't happen. This is too effective form of, this is such an effective form of outreach. Um, no, I, um, and then I grabbed Ava, you know, she's been doing them cubes for years. She's wonderful, she's like it's another generation too. You know, she she at the same time, she was still a teenager at the time and, and I, you know, 18 and, and I, you know, and I thought, well, be, hey, let's partner, Ava, would you be interested in, you know, we, we can't let this, uh, go away and they asked me as well there were you're interested and so I became an organizer a couple years ago thinking more eventually um to to help uh, other checks come along and, and they certainly did I mean you've got Ava's wonderful friends and activist friends and and other friends I knew from Teresa and and just uh so it's it's really grown we've really grown there's so many wonderful activists and eventually I'm handing the baton to other uh, other uh, Czech activists and uh, there who just so many wonderful ones it's it's um, so a couple of other people are coming on board as as organizers Lucie and Honza and you know, so it's just um, been a beautiful experience um, as an as a more being more open about my activism. I thought, you know, I came out of the closet. So a couple years ago, I came out of the closet. There's nothing wrong with it. I, of course, in the classroom, I'm completely professional. Uh, outside the classroom, I'm still professional, but you know, a little more open about it because I, it's also my personal life. And, and, but I think, you know, I think it's inspiring. I mean, we can inspire people's, uh, I feel people are inherently, I say this at the end of my TED talk, I feel underneath we are inherently uh, compassionate, and I'm I'm reconvinced when I I 
do outreach. Um, and that, and, and even if we were, I mean, yes, we have the potential to be very violent, but we could go either way, but education is so important. And that comes back to me as an educator and as a psychologist, you know, we can tap, help people tap into the, their kind nature, you know, and I love the name of your uh, channel, Kind Life, you know, it's like such a uh, beautiful, it's, it's about kindness. And I think we have at least, we all have that capacity, but at least as much, you know, but if it's nurtured, you know, we can do such great for the world. We can be so, so kind and, and wonderful. And, and so that's what I choose to focus on. And um, even recent primatologist, uh, Deval, a, a man from Netherlands, you know, he talks about this also finding it in other animals. He does these beautiful tests of morality um, and understanding of fairness. You know, we have the rhesus monkeys have shown actually higher levels of, and even rats, higher levels of morality, one could say, than humans. They were less willing in certain Milgram, this famous psychological test, they're less willing than, than the humans to do harm to each other um, anyway. So, and they had more to lose in the experiment. They wouldn't eat if they didn't harm, but they still would refuse to harm each other. So we're finding out so much more about animals as well. And it's science-based as well, not just what we clearly see if we have a companion animal, but anyway, so um, yeah. And I, so that's why, uh, so that's kind of my journey from veganism to activism uh, and in everything in between, you know, veganism, scholar, you know, the activity to education, psychology and activism. It, it's, it's all, there's so many links among them. Yeah, it's but. amazing. It's amazing to hear you've done so much. And I had no idea that you've been vegan for 25 years or so 20 years. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. It's, I'm healthier than I was then. I mean, I had so many health problems. And I don't, you know, every time I get a full, uh, they're like, whoa, you have a body of a 20 year old. I mean, you have nothing. You know, like, there's no, you know, and, and I don't even, I barely, well, maybe we should. I mean, once a week, I take a, a, a supplement, but, I, uh, but I'm more healthy now than I was, you know, over 20 years ago. So. <laughs> You're a great, yeah, great testament to a vegan lifestyle and one of, yeah, compassion. So before we finish up, is there any, any advice or anything you would like to share potentially with other vegans or activists that you just might be some lessons you've learned? Sure, sure. Well, uh, stay healthy. I mean, and take care of yourself. I see a lot of activists, we, we naturally are a lot of times empathic and care so much about others that we sometimes forget to take care of ourselves. And if we're not taking care of ourselves, both physically and psychologically, um, then we, um, if we still wanna stay with that, obviously we ultimately wanna end the suffering um, and it, it sometimes can torment, I know, I relate to other activists. Sometimes it's hard to sleep at night, you know, it, knowing the suffering out there. But if we don't take care of ourselves, um, we, we're not as effective of activists. I mean, for example, if I didn't take care of myself, I, I wouldn't be a good example, um, both physically and um, also in terms of my mental health as well. And I wouldn't be able to do as much for the animals. Plus I'm a person, we also have to re realize we're people, we deserve, we want, every, we want the happiness of others and, and we don't want others to suffer, including humans. So it's like, we're, I'm a human. I have to remind myself, you know, um, so we can often, so take care of yourself as well. And that's not a selfish thing because you're a human too. And being an activist, you can do so much for others. You know, I hear some the despair, especially those who are on the front lines, giving water to these precious, sometimes they need to take a break sometimes, you know, to take a break when you need and there's nothing wrong with that. And to realize too, how precious your life is, that what you can do for the animals. I mean, some, some activists will even sometimes have severe depression and, and I really want to encourage them and remind them how precious their life is. And also when a lot of that depression is related to the suffering of animals and the, maybe some, the, the 
the feeling that people don't care, which can also cause more suffering, um, to realize the power they have to help them and, and, and to, to not give up on yourself or the animals and to realize your value and to take care of your life. And also when um, on a practical level too, on a, when vegans, um, when a person is full out vegan and they're, they're wonderful and they'll have a conversation sometimes and, and, and that is wonderful. Being vegan itself saves so many lives. But I like to tell a story um, of the, uh, not sure where this story was originated. Uh, uh, I'm not sure where it originated, but it's of the man uh, is beating a dog. And if you walk past this scene and don't participate, you're a vegan. If you see the man beating the dog and stop the man from beating the dog, you're an activist, vegan activist. So it's, it's like, being an activist, you're actually helping, uh, by being vegan, you're stopping a certain amount of suffering, but you're actually help, helping others um, stop the suffering. You know, stop the, because we every time we buy meat, eggs, dairy, or honey, we're, we're paying for that suffering. So it's stopping that whole process. And, uh, and also it's helping the people too. Uh, one of the things I, research at National Institute of Mental Health is uh, post-traumatic stre post stress disorder. Uh, when we're looking at intergenerational trauma, for example, but, but, but then I've on my own, you know, and I also teach uh, general psychology. So, so this topic comes up a lot. There's a lot of literature that shows the, the, the high rates, high extremely high rates of post-traumatic stress disorder among slaughterhouse workers. If you think about it, how could there not be? I mean, you're literally killing, screaming, writhing, feeling beings every single day, um, often by the hundreds and maybe even more if you're depending on how small the animal, et cetera, is. But so so the uh, but also the lifting of the, the spirits you know, when you um, stop supporting the industry, people have shared with me how, how much better they feel psychologically um, and physically. So you're helping humans as well, you know, on every level, you know, so it's a win, 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 win. But, but so I think to inspire people, uh, just remember that, you know, to go that next step, you know, and there's so many kinds of activism too. There's, your own way you don't have to stand you know in an av you know anonymous for the voices or you can do writing you know some people beautiful brilliant writers or or have a sanctuary or or petitions i mean there's so many ways to contribute um and, and depending on the individual you know just like i started out this conversation where we all have different intellectual and emotional abilities um, we, same thing as activists, we have our own ways of, of do, being an activist or helping animals, starting with being vegan, of course, starting with stopping those actions ourselves, but, but we can take it further in our own way, and it's all good. <laughs> yeah. And well, I appreciate you. it all, <laughs> all, every one of you and every activist out there. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It's been such an amazing experience to talk to you. And yeah, you have so much knowledge. I learned a lot through your TED Talk and then even more tonight during our discussion. So I'll link, I'll link your social media and your TED Talks in the show notes so that people can have a look. And um, I'm sure if anyone has any questions, you're happy for them to reach out on social media, maybe through Instagram or... Yes, yes. Just my name, Edel Sanders, um, all... Uh, Ed, uh, well, depends on which which language, or, but E D E L as in Edelweiss, Edel Sanders, S A N D E R S, one word, um, at Instagram or Gmail, uh, same, just Edel Sanders at gmail.com. So one of those two ways you can reach out to me. I have a channel, I will be starting a channel. Um, um, I have a music channel <laughs> um, on the side, but I, I will be starting, um, it'll be believe I'll be calling it philosophical and psychological musings and I'll have a whole section on veganism uh I've already have a lot of videos from activism that I've done I'll I'll include yours if it's okay uh from our talk but 
but I will be starting that later spring and summer. And I, I do hope to also uh, do more talks and do uh, more, maybe even a, a program on the amazing aspect of animals, perhaps uh, Jane Goodall meets David, At David Attenborough meets Edel, I don't know, but some kind of program I'd like to do for the animals as well as possibly a book soon. So uh, those are future goals. <laughs> That's very exciting. That's yeah, extremely exciting. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really, it's lovely to meet you and, and thank you for what you're doing. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. And you said you had one more quote you wanted to share. Oh, well, it's the Einstein. Um, our task must be to free ourselves from this prison. Because he speaks about, he has a beautiful section before, but this, this prison of thinking only of ourselves. So he says, our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. And that's attributed to Einstein who himself uh, advocated for at least a vegetarian lifestyle. I think we didn't know as, as much as we do now about uh, the other foods, but he, uh, again, he spoke on it on, from a scientific level as well um, and advocated for it. Uh, bo both on an ethical and, and physical. And again, somehow it's surprising that he is not remembered uh, <laughs> at all, or he's not really known for that aspect, of course, because I think his theory of relatively kind of outshone that, uh, you know, that, that was kind of the focus of his fame. But um, anyway, so but he was, a, I, I believe, uh, amazing in many ways that we don't even realize. But so I love that quote and there's many beautiful ones out there but uh but thanks for asking <laughs> and, and thanks again for what you do thank you i really appreciate it take care okay same with you bye bye